Tonight's um, program is about peace. And I just wanted to remind you about the positive peace because we all know that peace is not anything that is in opposition, that is not only in opposition of war or conflict, but positive peace is quite a lot more. And we Rotarians are working on various issues concerning the positive peace and we are we are able to grow the positive peace with our actions. Um, then tonight, uh, I have a great honor and pleasure to present to you Peter Kyle, my dear friend, who is my, my uh, director colleague from Maryland, from Jones 33 and 34. Uh, you have seen his... Um, his CV already because I sent it to you, but he's, he's got quite a career as a peace builder in so many capacities. And I'm happy to welcome you, Peter, to speak to us uh, about Rotarian peace, so important in this world. Uh, I will stop sharing this right now. And the floor is yours, Peter. Great. Well, thank you, Verpi, for that nice introduction. Good evening, everybody. Nice to see uh, uh, lots of people on the screen. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk about Rotary's role as a peace building organization, because I think Rotary and peace just go together, uh, as I hope I will convince you uh, in a few minutes. Peace is in our DNA. So let me describe the, the, the context which has led Rotary to become uh, a peace building organization. As you know, we started in 1905 in Chicago, started fairly slowly. By 1910, there were only 16 Rotary clubs around the world. The focus was on service, but at that time, the forces of nationalism were beginning to arise in Europe. And as you will recall, in 1914, Germany and England declared war on each other. It was a terrible war, a lot of destruction, a lot of deaths, a lot of, a lot of uh, injuries. So when the war finished in 1918, the focus of Rotary Clubs became very much, how can we prevent a war like that from ever happening again. There's a strong focus on reconstruction in Europe uh, and the North American clubs equally concerned about ensuring uh, that Rotary become more focused on peace. In 1921 at the International Convention in Edinburgh, Rotarians passed a resolution calling for Rotarians to promote international understanding goodwill and peace. And those words, international understanding, goodwill and peace, have since become enshrined in the object of Rotary. And they are, of course, the foundation for the activities of the Rotary Foundation. Rotary clubs continued to grow quite rapidly in the 20s and 30s. In 1939, we chartered club number 5,000. At that time, we had around 150,000 Rotarians all around the world. Rotary was an enormous organization. It was a mini United Nations. At that time, Rotary was extremely influential. The classification criteria were applied quite strictly. You had to be a, a male. And of course, we've, we've since addressed that uh, situation. And you had to be a partner or a manager or a school principal or a superintendent of police or, or someone uh, relatively senior in your vocation or your profession. So when Rotarians came together at a district conference, it was truly a meeting of community movers and shakers. And when Rotarians met 
at an international convention, this was a world event, very, very influential. In 1940, Rotarians met in Havana, Cuba, of all places. And I might just say that at that time in Cuba, there were 58 Rotary clubs. Currently, there are none, although we hope that that will change before too long. And at that convention, Rotarians passed a resolution calling for, amongst other things, respect for human rights. That was the first time those words respect for human rights had entered into the international vocabulary. And that became the basis for the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights signed in 1948. At that time, there was no such thing as a non-governmental organization. Now there are thousands of NGOs around the world. But prior to the, first, the Second World War, uh, there were no such things as NGOs. Rotary was in effect the first non-governmental organization. In 1942, a number of senior Rotarians met in London. They were concerned about the impact of the war on education, on scientific research, on cultural traditions and monuments. Um, and that led to a resolution uh, which later became the basis for UNESCO. United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. In 1944, Prime Minister Churchill and President Truman decided that the time had come to establish an organization which would prohibit war for all time. Rotary was one of a very small number of organizations who were invited to send lawyers and other experts to work alongside officials from China, the former Soviet Union, the United States, and the United Kingdom. And when the United Nations Charter was signed in San Francisco in June of 1945, 49 out of the 800 delegates were Rotarians. The following year, the United Nations decided to establish an internship program. The idea was to bring young people from all around the world to New York to observe the workings of this new entity. Great idea, but there was no money. What did the United Nations do? They approached Rotary and Rotary agreed to fund the first United Nations internship program in 1946. Rotary continued to expand dramatically in the 50s, 60s and 70s but the relationship with the United Nations largely went into abeyance. This was the period of the Cold War um, and clubs were more concerned with local uh, issues rather than international issues. But Rotary re-engaged with the United Nations in 1985 uh, when we established the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. We partnered with the World Health Organization and with uh, CDC, and of course with UNICEF, and subsequently with the Gates Foundation and with Gavi and, and other organizations. In the light, late 1980s, Rotarians were increasingly reaching out to other UN organs, to UNESCO, to UNICEF, to UNHCR, and other international organizations. So in 1990, the board established the Rotary Representative Network. This is the body that oversees Rotary's relationships with the United Nations and other international organizations. We have appointed 32 uh, Rotarians. We call them representatives. In a way, they are ambassadors. Um, and we have 16 organizations in the network. UNICEF, UNESCO, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the World Health Organization, the Food and Agricultural Organization, and other international organizations such as the European Union, the Commonwealth of Nations, the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, 
the World Bank, the Organization for American States. And Rotary has appointed representatives uh, in the uh, places, in the cities where those organizations are based. So we have two representatives in Rome, two in Paris, two in Brussels, two in London, three in Geneva, where the UN uh, European headquarters are based. We have six in New York, four in Washington, DC, and others spread around the world in Manila, in Abidjan, in Cairo, in Addis Ababa. And their role initially was to promote awareness of what Rotary is and was doing around the world, particularly in relation to polio. More recently, uh, the responsibility for these uh, individuals has expanded. It's now more of a two-way process. Not only can we contribute uh, to these organizations, but we can benefit uh, from learning how they, how they approach humanitarian and developmental projects. For example, how does UNICEF uh, carry out community assessments? How does UNESCO evaluate projects? We can learn from their experience. They are international, they are much larger than Rotary, um, and we can partner with these organizations. And increasingly uh, around the world, Rotary is partnering with these organizations. Let me give you an example. Uh, three years ago, uh, Rotary decided to have a Rotary Day in Nairobi at the African headquarters of the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations Environmental Program, which is the environmental arm of the UN, is based in Nairobi. I went down to Kenya as part of the planning team, and while I was there, I asked to meet uh, with a with representatives of the UN environment. Five young people came into the room, all young environmental activist looking people. Unbeknown to us, the team leader of this group was a Rotary Peace Fellow from New Zealand. Doesn't get much better than that. One of the other representatives was a former ambassadorial scholar. A third person was the president of one of the local clubs. And they came prepared with a list of 25 projects, which they thought might be of interest to clubs and districts around the world. That led to a meeting between then President Barry Rasson and the Director General of the UN Environment, which led to a meeting between John Huco, the CEO of Rotary, and senior officials of UN Environment, and that led to a decision uh, to establish a task force to prepare a, uh, a handbook on how to do environmental projects. Uh, this was a, a joint effort involving UN Environment, the staff in Evanston, and Rotary's Environmental Sustainable Rotary Action Group. And the publication was produced last year, or rather in 2019, in Hamburg at the International Convention. It's a very impressive publication. You can download it from the Rotary website, and it contains all sorts of useful information on how to identify project, environmental projects, how to do community assessments, how to evaluate uh, environmental projects. So a very tangible outcome of a collaboration between Rotary and uh, a UN organization. And we are in the process of developing other handbooks uh, in the other areas of focus, maternal and child health, literacy, and so on. Another outcome of the uh, Nairobi trip was a decision by UN Environment and the Rotary Clubs in Nairobi to enter into a memorandum of understanding uh, pursuant to which uh, the Rotary Clubs in Nairobi are involved in a very big project to clean up various rivers that flow through or nearby Nairobi. Again, working with UN Environment staff 
and using best practices. Another good example of the collaboration. Of course, one of the main activities of the Rotary Representative Group uh, was to have Rotary Days. For many years, we had a Rotary Day in New York. In fact, the Rotary Day in New York was the third most significant event on the annual Rotary calendar after the annual convention and the International Assembly. Recently, uh, last year, again, I have to get used to saying the year before last, in 2019, uh, we celebrated the 75th anniversary of the signing of the UN Charter, and therefore the 75th anniversary of the signing of the relationship between Rotary and the United Nations. And President Mark Maloney decided to have five presidential conferences around the world to celebrate this relationship. The first was held in New York in November of 2019. Uh, the next four, one was to be held in Santiago, Chile, one in Paris at UNESCO, one in Rome at FAO, and the final conference was to be held in Honolulu as part of the convention. But as you know, uh, because of COVID-19, uh, they were cancelled and, and the riots in Santiago, we had to cancel those four conferences, which was a great shame because we had some wonderful speakers lined up. This year with President Holger Nark, we have two Rotary Days. One took place last November in Brussels uh, in connection with polio. And this was a, an opportunity to celebrate uh, the contributions which the countries to the European Union have made to polio. Uh, the second event was to be held at the end of February in Geneva at the World Health Organization headquarters. And the focus was to be on maternal and child health, which is one of our main areas of focus. Uh, but because of COVID-19, that has been postponed to later in the year. And there are plans uh, during the next Rotary year to have other Rotary Days uh, at the UN. So the relationship between Rotary and the UN has always been very, very strong. Uh, and I think we are moving to a phase where it's likely to get even more strong. There are great opportunities for clubs and districts around the world to partner on projects with UNICEF, with UNESCO, uh, and with other UN agencies, UN Commission on Women. Uh, we sent a, a Rotarian two years ago to the environmental conference in Katowice in Poland, uh, COP COP24, and we'll probably do that again this year. So the, the role of peace in Rotary has really been very strong. Uh, late last century in the 1990s, uh, a committee of Rotarians decided to establish the Rotary Peace Centre program. Uh, the first cohort entered into uh, operation in 2002. So we're now in our 19th year of the Rotary Peace Centres program. And we have over 1600 graduates all around the world, many of whom are now occupying positions of responsibility in international organisations. Uh, there are nine at the World Bank. I think there are over a dozen in the United Nations. So we're beginning to get a very significant return on our investment. Uh, we have six schools around the world. Uh, you're probably familiar with the one in Uppsala in Sweden. And we have schools in England, in Australia, in Japan, um, in North America. And we have two uh, certificate programs. That's the shorter course one in Bangkok, Thailand, and one was supposed to start this month in Kampala, Uganda. Uh, but that, uh, that will be a virtual uh, rather than an in-person event. Uh, we're excited about the, the new center in Uganda. Uganda is a very strong Rotary country and the Ugandans are thrilled that they are hosting uh, a Rotary Peace Center. In addition, uh, we've established a Rotary Peace Action Group, which is very active, uh, particularly in North America and in parts of Europe. There are many peace conferences around the world. Every three years, we have a peace symposium. We bring peace fellows together uh, to celebrate the Peace Centre program. 
we have a peace academy, we have peace workshops. Many Rotarians ask, how can I, as an individual Rotarian, how can I contribute to peace? Well, you can now go online to the Rotary Learning Center and there are various courses that you can do. And once you've passed, you will receive a certificate as a Rotarian peace builder. So I encourage you to consider exploring the Rotary Learning Center. It's a very, it's a very, it's a wealth of information, a wealth of programs. So I'm often asked after polio, uh, what will be the next corporate project? Um, of course, the official line is that we mustn't talk about future projects. We need, need to keep our eye on the ball and finish the job with polio, and we will, we will complete the eradication of polio. But if I was a betting man, I think the next corporate project would involve uh, some aspect of peace and education. As I've tried to explain, peace is in our DNA. Uh, I don't think we will ever become a maternal and child health organization. The World Health has got that cornered. I don't think we'll become a water and sanitation organization. There are many hundreds of organizations that are far better resourced and equipped uh, to handle the technical aspects of water and sanitation. But in the area of peace, I think it will be possible to carve out a niche for Rotary. Uh, I'm involved in developing my own project in zones 33 and 34. It's called Youth Plus Peace in Action, engaging 100,000 young community peace builders. And we're very excited about this. We've raised quite a lot of money and we'll be rolling out a very significant project uh, throughout the 31 districts in zones 33 and 34, involving dozens of community peace-related events. And that I think is uh, a prototype of how Rotary might move forward in the peace and education area. So that's uh, uh, a short background. I hope, uh, Burpee, I haven't spoken too long. Um, I hope you'll get a, uh, a good sense of the importance of the United Nations and Rotary's history and the role that Rotary is playing uh, with the United Nations in developing projects and collaborations around the world. I think it's exciting. I think there's a lot of potential for future growth. Um, and I'm delighted to play a small role in promoting Rotary's peace building agenda. So with that, I'll stop. I'm happy if there's time to answer any questions. Um, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, over to you, Vepi. Oh, thank you so much, Peter. This, this was, uh, even though um, I have tried to learn my lesson, but uh, this was a uh, wonderful um, way of looking at the, actually the importance of Rotary within, within all these times. And of course, uh, these are the part of history that, that we maybe didn't know about or weren't so familiar with. Um, and it was really interesting how you illustrated uh, how in the decisions and uh, people met in Nairobi could actually uh, become into, into such a um, uh, great um, amount of words, um, collaboration and, and understanding and then, then really in, into hands-on projects. And, and that's really something that I, I very much appreciate. But my friends, any questions, comments? Yes. Um, hi, Peter. I'm hi. from Stockholm, <laughs> uh, Sweden. And uh, I'm very interested in what, what, what type of uh, project you have in New Zealand you, you're talking about. Uh, do you have any more information or, or website or whatever? Yes. Uh, I, I live in America. I'm from New Zealand, but I now live in America. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah. So I'd be very happy to send you the website. Uh, 
I am so excited about this project. We've had uh, a number of presentations to the district governors, the DGEs, the DGNs. Um, uh, it, it's quite an involved project. It's taken us six months to put it together. So I will, uh, if it's okay with you, I'll send the, uh, the website to Verpi and a copy of the presentation and perhaps she'd be kind enough to circulate it uh, uh, after the meeting. Yes, thank you. Yes. We're working with hundreds of Interact clubs and Rotaract clubs, so that's the key. Tore. Uh, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. Uh, in, in a nutshell, you really, really triggered us and gave us the historical views as well as the challenges for tomorrow. I was just wondering, um, when you say that we have to finish uh, uh, and polio first before we look at the next uh, project. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit there? Isn't it possible to have a two-pronged uh, approach as we, I, I feel we have? By the way, I'm the HEC, uh, the coordinator in the Uppsala Peace Center. Oh, good. Well, thank you for your work in Uppsala. I've, I've been there, uh, it's a fantastic Peace Center um, and uh, producing some high quality graduates. Um, we've talked about uh, other big corporate projects. I think the, the main concern with senior Rotary leaders is that polio is such a big project and it is so important that we finish the job. Uh, if we embark on a second or third or fourth project, uh, we, we run the risk of diluting uh, the importance of polio and diverting funds to other purposes. So um, I think what is, what is happening around the world, um, last year the board decided to establish a, a very significant grant, a $2 million grant. Um, and when we called for uh, applications, we received over 70, which indicated that there are a large number of very significant international projects around the world uh, involving multi-clubs, multi-districts, multi-million dollars. Uh, and over time, some of those projects might increase in size and scope and, and become candidates for the next corporate project. I think that's really the thinking. But at the present time, uh, I think the board is, is fairly heavily focused on eradicating polio. I can, I can just check, but that doesn't take away the the opportunity we have to to really work for peace and promote the, the peace centers and and work around those or related to those as well as what you mentioned from from New Zealand and and the two districts there other regions there, the zones. Sorry, right. so we can still focus on peace uh, without being uh, being uh, sort of uh, in in a. In a, in a second division, we can still in the, be in the forefront and, and promote this Absolutely. work. Absolutely. What I what I omitted to mention is that, and, and Verpi referenced this at the outset, uh, Rotary has partnered with two significant peace building organizations. One is the Institute for Economics and Peace, which has developed the positive peace concept, the World Peace Index, and we have partnered with Mediators Beyond Borders which is also a very large organization. Um, so I think there, there are many aspects of peace in which Rotary is engaged. The, the peace program, the peace rag, the peace partnerships, peace conferences. Um, as, I, as I said before, peace is in our DNA. Um, and I think there are many peace education projects. Uh, the, the focus of of uh, my project in Zone 33 and 34 is on youth uh, and, and communities. All, all conflicts arise locally. So we need to come up with local solutions. Rotary is a 
local community-based organization, it is extremely well positioned to take a lead role. And I think it's important that we engage the youth. Young people don't have uh, the biases and the prejudices and the hang-ups and the cynicism and the skepticism that we all have. Uh, we need to get them as young as possible and encourage them to uh, feel comfortable with notions of respect and ethics um, and, and move away from conflict and bullying and so on. Um, so I think it's important that we, we, we focus on local community youth related activities and that's what my, my initiative is all about. So this was great to hear. Thank you. Uh, I think Mark, uh, do you have your hand up? Yes, please. Just un unmute yourself so we can hear you better. Sorry. Um, thank you for a wonderful presentation. It is such a huge topic that we are tackling here. Uh, it has so many aspects to it. And uh, I wonder how much more we can do. I wanted to add to the comment you made about uh, the next big project. We actually have the six areas of focus, which are huge areas of activity for Rotary. And the next one that's coming up is number seven, which will, which will get approved officially this year, um, is the sustainability and, and protecting the environment. So we actually do have a new area of focus, not a new project specifically, but we have new areas that we grow into so Rotary is constantly expanding its uh, area of uh, interest and influence. And I'm very uh, pleased we're doing that. I, um, I wonder if you could add in your comments something about how you see peace building as an activity, because we talk about it as an idea, but how do we actually achieve results? I've been working on this for a couple of years, and I don't know if you had a chance to come to the breakout session I had in Hamburg about creating a peace building society. How do you make people think in terms of peace? Uh, because genetically, I think human beings generally succeed through aggressive means in most visible ways. But there must be ways that we can approach specific activities. For example, we spoke about teaching people to paint dreams about their countries, even when they're uh, under severe stress from conflict. Um, that people start to think about the future and what they would like to happen in their country. Can you suggest any ways that we can focus our activities and our energy on actually creating a peaceful environment? Sorry. Sorry, uh, both telephones are, are ringing. Um, no, that's a good question. I think there are Peace is, is such a broad topic, and it means different things to different people. Um, there are many examples of peace building projects. It, it may be working with um, trafficking, working with human rights, working with uh, bullying in schools, um, uh, working with refugees. There's no, there's no one type of peace building. I, in fact, in some ways, everything we do in Rotary has a, has a peace building dimension. Uh, we are working to create um, more peaceful societies. We're working to reduce corruption, uh, promote the rule of law. All the, the, eight, the eight key factors in the positive peace uh, index, uh, Rotary is engaged in one form or another uh, in, in promoting each of those areas. Um, so I, I don't know that there's any one particular route. Uh, each country has its own value system. Uh, I think working with, uh, working with young people in particular, I think has a lot of potential. We, we, need, to, we need to create a much greater awareness of uh, the importance of of peaceful relations and, and being respectful, um, understanding differences. Um, so that to me is, uh, 
that I think is a priority and, and Rotary is well positioned um, to provide guidance in that area. Um, we are by nature, we are leaders, we are uh, mentors. Um, and I think uh, we have a lot to contribute to the next generation uh, in terms of lessons learned and uh, conveying, passing on our experience. Uh, we have, uh, no, I lost sight of you. We have one peace fellow here, Francesco. Did I lose you somewhere? Oh, there you are. It's funny how, you know, pictures or faces change their places on my screen. But uh, Francesco, you're studying in Uppsala, right? So could we please hear uh, uh, something about your background and your comments on, on being a Peace uh, Fellow student at the moment, please? Yeah, of course. Um, first of all, thank you, Peter. It was a interesting and inspiring presentation to see how Rotary has been there shaping the works of history and peace for a very long time. That is, it, it gives me a powerful sense of belonging, which is very nice. I am a Mexican peace fellow. I am studying peace and conflict studies at Uppsala University. And over the past few years, I've been working in precisely in peace building um, projects with young people uh, in regards to violent prevention, nonviolent uh, communication, and positive, positive peace initiatives. So I've been involved in um, designing strategies for uh, teaching peace in public high schools in places in Mexico with higher, high, in, high index of, indexes of violence. I've been doing mediation and negotiation on multi-actor level for various years in Mexico. And more recently, I've been engaging with the rights of the LGBTQ community and the human rights of, of sexual minorities. So um, for me being at, at a place where, where other people are dreaming also about peace and are taking it seriously with a scientific approach on research and constantly creating new new knowledge and better approaches to understand how we can make better our work as peace builders has been fundamentally i think it's going to be a game changer on my perspective of how to continue building peace so for that i'm i'm super grateful and well i've been doing this for for a couple of years so if I can provide any useful insight for your project, or I'd be more than happy to help. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Francisco. Uh, this, is, this is a great way of networking, you know. Um, to me, when, when I have been thinking about peace, I have also been thinking about, uh, the, the, I would say the, the most precious project that I have been involved in, um, where um, people in the in that area of India, where there is a a huge lack of water outside of um, monsoon rains, um, and I think this relates to a lot of people in the world, uh, which uh, are situated or whose home is in the area where a severe drought is there every year and uh, that's one reason why why people would leave their homes because they cannot live anymore when they don't have water so they they can't grow anything or or they can they cannot provide for their living or for for the lives of, of their families and um when we started with the project by providing rainwater harvesting so you know, for, for me, it was just uh, providing water for, for the village uh, all year round. And um, my comprehension, you know, comes from Finland, where we have water all over. We have a lot of water everywhere. And, and it's very difficult for me to, to um, imagine a situation where we would not have water. Well, of course, we don't have many other things that those people in India in that area have, but 
as we provided the water and the village people could um, start their journey from poverty into prosperity. And it happened only in five years because we were there four years earlier to see the situation one year oh, after we started the project. And then we went back five years later when the project was finished four years earlier. And we could see the tremendous change. And none of these people want to leave their village. They're very happy there. And, and they, they grow all these vegetables and, and they sell them in, in the markets in the city nearby. And, and they uh, have built a school for their children. And they have all these dreams and visions how they can make their living better. These people, they don't want to leave their homes. They are so happy there. They are peaceful. And I think, you know, that, that's uh, sort of um, made me think that actually by, by doing these projects, we can accomplish so much more than we could have expected or, or thought, you know, to begin with. And I think that's a, the same thing, I think, applies with, with all, all the... This is one, one peace program, of course, when you, when you look at it from, from um, various points. But um, sometimes we can, we can start with small things, sort of. And I would say that um, also these universities where the peace program started, so that was kind of small. Okay, you, you have what, about... 100 students per year and now over the years more than 1600 uh, people have graduated from there and and they are in various positions and they are doing the peace work i, I think it's really amazing i get carried away so please anybody else who would like to have a question or a comment Yes, uh, Peter, uh, what, what can a small uh, club do uh, at the beginning for, for a start? My club is, we are 42 members in a suburb of Stockholm. And uh, what, what can we do as a project? What can we help our community? for or will for a start? I, I think the first thing I would do is encourage as many members of the club as possible to go online to the Rotary Learning Centre and complete the courses to become a Rotarian Peace Builder. I think you will find that that will open up all sorts of ideas and opportunities on practical ways uh, that your members and your club uh, can apply peace building principles. And then I would, I would look uh, into areas around Stockholm uh, uh, that may not be as well resourced, as well endowed as others, uh, potential areas of, of conflict. Um, seek out law enforcement seek out the school superintendents uh, uh, and, and identify ways where uh, Rotarians can be involved in serving as mentors, serving as role models, particularly the female members. Um, there's a lot of research that shows that uh, female peace builders tend to be more successful than male peace builders. Um, don't ask me to expand on that research. I, I simply take it as, uh, as given. Um, uh, but intuitively, uh, I think that's right. Someone told me recently that the countries that have been most successful in combating COVID-19 have been led by females. Whether there's a direct correlation between that, uh, I don't know. Um, 
certainly my own country, New Zealand, we have a wonderful prime minister uh, who is much respected and much loved. Uh, and she has single-handedly created a team New Zealand approach uh, to various uh, unpleasant incidents that uh, New Zealand has had in the last few years. Uh, so I think there's a, there's a particular role for females to play in peace building. Let me just leave it at that. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I have a question from, from Pekka who, who just put it on, on the chat and he wants to know um, your opinion on what kind of connection is uh, to the United Nations peacekeeping and the programs for uh, United Nations peace courses. So Rotary has not been directly involved in, in peacekeeping operations. Uh, that's really beyond our, our remit. Uh, our focus has been on peace building rather than peacekeeping. Um, we have quite a number of Rotary Peace Fellows working in the United Nations. Some are working uh, in, in peacekeeping operations. Um, I know of two uh, that are currently or have been active in Afghanistan uh, working um, as uh, intermediaries between uh, the military and, and civilian populations in Afghanistan. So I think the Peace Fellows are more involved in this area. Um, there's a very active group in North America promoting uh, a greater role for Rotary in terms of nuclear disarmament. Uh, there's a role uh, actively involved in uh, nonviolent uh, police force, nonviolent conflict. Um, so in many parts of the world, Rotarians are quite actively engaged in different aspects of peace building. Uh, and I, uh, I hope that over time, uh, we, can, we can sort of coordinate uh, some of these initiatives. Um, because as I said before, I think the one area where Rotary uh, can make a long-term difference is in the area of, of peace and peace and education in particular. I think that uh, uh, leaving aside polio, uh, the Rotary Peace Centre program has the possibility of being Rotary's most enduring legacy. After we've, after we've eradicated polio, the peace program, and I'm, I'm heavily involved in that. I chaired the, I was on the committee for four years. I chaired the, the Peace Centers Committee, which is the committee that selects the Peace Fellows. Um, I've been to all the Peace Centers around the world and I have a lot to do with Peace Fellows. Uh, and we have some outstanding Peace Fellows, and, and the number is growing by 100, 120 each year. Uh, not every Peace Fellow is destined to be a star. Uh, not every Rotarian is a great Rotarian, but we have a high number of very able, uh, very impressive Rotary Peace Fellows in all sorts of uh, conflict areas and non-conflict areas. Um, so I, as I say, I think uh, the PEACH program was a great uh, investment by Rotary. We are now beginning to get a return on that investment in the form of uh, high level representation. And this, this will just get better and better. So uh, I think uh, that to me is, is one of Rotary's most successful projects, most successful initiatives. Uh, Peter, um, <clears throat> in a way, we have to uh, be more, uh, what to say, um, skillful to tell our story. Yes. And uh, to tell our story, we have to know our own story so we can tell the story. And uh, we, we are... Um, very uh, thirsty of knowledge, of course, and uh, this this uh, your, your speak uh, today w was an eye opener for me, and uh, I, I I really uh, like to to and proud of what Rotary had done 
uh, since uh, 1905, 1905 and uh, the connection with the UN and, and all the branches in UN. And uh, there's a, not a common uh, knowledge about that, I think. And we have to be more uh, precise and better to, to tell that story. No, I, I absolutely agree. Um, it, it's a common complaint uh, Rotarians make that we, we are not as good at promoting ourselves, promoting awareness of ourselves as we could be or should be. Uh, on the other hand, we have a, a very competent, a very large um, communication department within Evanston, uh, very actively involved in all sorts of social media, print media, news media. Um, the amount of information that Rotary churns out every year is quite extraordinary, uh, but somehow or other, it doesn't necessarily get down to the, uh, to the, no. to the local clubs or the local Rotarians or to the external community. One thing I will say is that Rotary is very well known in the higher levels of governments and international organizations. I'm quite sure that the Prime Minister of Finland and the President of Finland and all the senior, Rotary, senior officials in uh, Helsinki are very well aware of Rotary, very well aware of the polio initiative. Um, so we, we've, been, we've done a good job of um, advocacy within governments and within international organizations. Um, but as someone said, uh, how much do we know about lions? I don't know much about lions. And yet lions is about the same size as Rotary. Um, we tend to focus on our own organization. Uh, yes, we can always do more to promote what Rotary is doing, but I actually think that given the, 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 the money available and the resources, uh, Rotary does a pretty good job uh, with what it has. I do agree. And one thing I think what we have uh, learned um, I don't know if it's correct to say lately, but uh, we have learned to collaborate more. Uh, I've been a Rotarian for only about 20 years. And uh, in the beginning, it wasn't actually proper even to talk about collaboration with other organizations. Uh, on, on the contrary, um, we were kind of, uh, I would say, encouraged to get rid of our connections to other organizations if we happen to have some of those. But uh, now I think it, it has changed completely. And now we see the value of other organizations, also of uh, other governments, of course. And I think this is uh, the, the area where we can do a lot more. No, I, I agree, uh, Verpi. Uh, there was a time when the prevailing view was, we are Rotary, we can do this ourselves, we don't need anybody else. But now there's a realization that uh, one plus one uh, can make three or four or five. Uh, we need to partner in the world. We, we can't do everything ourselves. We don't need to reinvent the wheel each time. Um, one of the challenges for Rotary is to find the right partners and develop the right partnerships. Um, we get over three, I used to serve on the partnership committee, Rotary gets over 300 applications a year from organizations wanting to partner with Rotary. Many of them just want our money. Um, some want our brand, some want our reach, 1.2 million Rotarians. Um, but Rotary has always been very mindful of its brand. We, we have a very, very strong brand and we need to maintain that. 
so we don't enter into partnerships lightly. Uh, in fact, we only have about, I think about a dozen partnerships, leaving aside the Rotary Peace Center program and the, the universities that we partner with. Um, I think we should be, we should partner more, um, uh, but I'm, I'm a sort of, I'm an internationalist. Uh, there are others in Rotary uh, who take a different view uh, that Rotary is a, a community-based organization and that's where we should focus our time and our resources. Um, so as we move forward and as uh, Rotary evolves, uh, it'll be interesting to see in which direction we go. Uh, in some parts of the world, Rotary is doing very well. In other parts, the membership is declining. Membership is declining in North America, uh, but funding for the Rotary Foundation is increasing. Um, membership is booming in South Asia. Um, and, and the funding is also increasing except that they uh, are subject to government rules which prevent money from India uh, leaving the country. So there are lots of challenges for Rotary moving forward. Uh, and uh, it's a fun time for Verpi and myself to be on the RI board. Well, that was well said, fun time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter. Mark, you wanted uh, a comment or a question? Just to comment on Peter's uh, mention about partnering. I don't know if you're aware, but in Australia, uh, a lot of uh, projects are done by Rotary and Alliance together. And I've been to many parks, which are fairly big projects usually, because Australia is a big land, where there is a sign right at the entrance having both logos side by side saying this project was funded by Rotary and Alliance or vice versa. And I think that really expands the reach tremendously. I'm not sure if it's the same in New Zealand. Do you know if New Zealand has the same approach? Not so much. I, I think there are some joint projects, but it's, it's developing. What is interesting is that uh, Rotary is going through a, a process of uh, thinking about change. Um, in some parts of the world, Australia is one and the United Kingdom is another, uh, are moving ahead quite rapidly in terms of change. Uh, the districts in Australia have got together um, uh, and, and they're determined to find ways to revitalize the organization. And if one route is partnering with uh, Lions and other service organizations, then so be it. Um, the end result is to provide better service to the community. Um, and whatever it takes to achieve that objective, I think is, is worth pursuing. So uh, it's good to hear about uh, activities in Australia. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I can't see any hands waving at me eagerly. So I think uh, this, this is about it. I thank all of you. And especially I thank you, Peter, for for giving us your time and your wisdom. Oh. This was most wonderful. And um, I think uh, Lars Eric probably wants to close the recording uh, quite soon.